Blog Talk Radio. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. I'm Scott Nickrens, music director at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, and you're listening to The Concert from GardnerMuseum.org. Join me in the museum's tapestry room as we listen to some outstanding live performances you won't hear anywhere else. This week, for our 16th episode of the concert, we'll be listening to two pieces for two very different solo instruments, piano and cello. First on the program, cellist Colin Carr will play Bach's fifth cello suite. This is one of six solo suites Bach wrote for the cello. In these pieces, made up of solo melodic lines, harmony still plays a big role. In fact, while you're listening, you may notice your ear filling in notes that aren't actually played, like connecting the dots on a page. In this suite, Bach gives the listener just enough dots to evoke those harmonies while still retaining a melancholy sparseness in the music. It's also interesting to realize that each of the movements of the suite is based on a different style of dance. While Bach probably didn't intend for people to dance to the cello suites, the forms he uses come from this tradition. After the delicacy of the Bach cello suites, the opening of Schubert's A Minor Piano Sonata seems downright bombastic. The first movement shuttles back and forth between declarative chords, like the opening, and longer poetic lines, a familiar hallmark of Schubert's style. This performance is played by pianist Seymour Lipkin. Before we get to the rousing finale, let's listen to the solo cello, played by Colin Carr. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in for another program of the cow's context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade. Thank you all. Beautiful set. I don't know uh, where folks are listening from, but here in the Pacific Northwest, it is an amazing Saturday afternoon, Uh, beautiful weather. Uh, It has not been this gorgeous in a long time. could be investing my time and energy and sitting outside and going down to the lake doing lots of things to frolic out here in the wonderful uh, outdoors weather of the Pacific Northwest, but we are here to get constructive information on the system of white supremacy. 
before uh, we kick off today's show, I want to take uh, a moment to thank uh, everyone who uh, has supported uh, listening to the context of White Supremacy Radio Show. Uh, thank Mr. Uh, Edward Williams over at Counter Dash Racism, uh, playing all of the programs that I have aired uh, here on Blog Talk Radio, putting them, uh, rebroadcasting the programs uh, on the Counter Racism Network. I uh, appreciate his support. I uh, make effort to uh, play his, pro, uh, play his uh, commercials whenever I can. Please make sure you check him out, counter-racism.com. I also want to thank uh, all the listeners who have supported uh, from the code.net, uh, Hakima, uh, SingQ, uh, Mr. Josh Wickett actually called the program not that long ago, uh, Mr. Michael Fisher, uh, Mac Payne, Everybody, uh, even the admitted racist known as Hunter, uh, thank you all for listening out at thecode.net. I uh, also want to thank uh, folks that have uh, tuned in and helped promote the show uh, at dayofoutrage.ning, uh, Mr. Nat Turner. I also want to thank uh, harambeconnection.ning. They have been very helpful uh, in promoting the show and getting other people to tune in, listen to the broadcast. I have uh, definitely... Uh, appreciated uh, their assistance. Um, my man Scotty, blacktalkradio.ning, he's called the show, helped promote it, <clears throat> and getting other people to listen to the broadcast. Uh, all the assistance, I, I definitely uh, appreciated. Also wanted to make sure I remembered uh, Amani, non-white female, victim of racism, white supremacy down in the Bay Area. Uh, she helped me out with the last show as well. Uh, again, I'm super grateful for all the assistance that I got on the last program. Uh, Susie Hu, non-white female, so-called Asian, definitely a victim of white supremacy like myself, assisting me last show. Uh, and also Hakima, please make sure you check out her blog, uh, Frisky Kitty Counter Racism Scratch Post. Lots of constructive information on how to combat the system of racism, white supremacy. Um, yeah, and definitely want to give a shout out. Uh, back of the bus, constructive assistance promoting the uh, promoting the show. Please check out his blog, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. My man, back of the bus, uh, always focused, constructively focused on replacing white supremacy with justice. Um, very productive week. Looking to a productive and constructive broadcast, uh, Dr. Eddie Moore, Jr., uh, the founder of the White Privilege Conference. I uh, met him uh, two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, he was uh, responsible for bringing the admitted white supremacist known as Tim Wise uh, here to Seattle uh, to give a presentation, presentation dealing with racism, white supremacy, and uh, spoke with uh, Dr. Eddie Moore after the event. Uh, we talked about a little bit about his conference and uh, his views on racism, white supremacy, and I told him about my program, and he said uh, he would be willing to uh, come on the show and talk about the system of white supremacy and what uh, objectives he has with the White Privilege Conference and how that is supposed to combat the system of white supremacy. So definitely looking forward to having him on the line to speak with us. Um, he, uh, I'm waiting for him to give me a jingle. Um, in the meantime, in between time, if any of the listeners, uh, if you would like to call in, if you have anything you would like to speak on, on racism, white supremacy, feel free to do so. Uh, I can share with our listeners it has been a very productive week uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Myself and several other victims of white supremacy were asked to do uh, a small presentation for two different classes at the University of Washington. Uh, they have a class. The name of the class is Rethinking Diversity. Okay, Rethinking Diversity. We go to this class, and uh, it's more than 100 students uh, in this class. Uh, they break the class down into smaller groups for individual sections. 
so that you can you know generate more discussion about the material uh, in smaller group sections. And we go to two of these smaller group sections, and we go to talk uh, exclusively about the system of white supremacy. And the first class, I felt, you know, mostly white students in both of these class classes. And uh, the first class, I felt, you know, the white students were pretty open. They asked questions. Uh, they answered. We asked a ton of questions, myself and the other uh, non-white male uh, who were doing this presentation. We asked lots of questions. Uh, one of what I felt, one of the highlights, uh, we asked if white supremacists, racists, if they assume if you are white, you are racist. The white students responded, yes. Every white student in the first class said yes. Uh, and, and really, there was no hesitation. It was just kind of a, yeah, of course. Um, and so we said, okay, so following the same logic, if you are non-white, should you assume that if you are white, you are racist? She said, yeah. I said, okay. And this is on videotape, too. I, I really don't even want to talk too much about it because this was uh, recorded. Uh, and we hope to uh, get you know, this taken care of, all the uh, good technical stuff taken care of and get it uploaded so that people can view this footage because I felt it was very interesting, very constructive uh, for folks who are interested in studying racism, white supremacy. Um, so that was the first class. We went to the second class, and we asked a lot of the same questions. Uh, interesting things happened in the second class. I'll, I'll leave that for the footage once we get it uh, uploaded. The second class, we get to the end, and there was a non-white person. He had raised his hand uh, at the beginning of the at the of the beginning of our discussion. He raised his hand and he said, "Well." Uh, I'm half white. That count is white. And we asked the white people, and they said no. The white people looked at him and said, no, you're not white. And uh, we get to the end of the discussion, and he says, well, what's your view on interracial relationships? And, you know, I gave my compensatory response. You know, I do not encourage, condone, participate in sexual relationships between non white and white people under the system of white supremacy. And it looked as though we had tossed a bucket of ice cold water on everyone in the room. Uh, they were just stunned. Uh, and to be really accurate about what happened, many of the white people looked as though uh, their hand was caught in the cookie jar. Um, it was, I mean, it was just interesting. Like I said, this is on video, so hopefully this footage will be uploaded and people can view for themselves and see the response that I generated just in saying this. At any rate, um, very interesting ha thing happened is that all of the non-white people in the class, I believe except for one person, as soon as the presentation ended, all of the non-white people came up and wanted further explanation and more information about why I said there should not be sexual intercourse between white people and non-white people under the system of white supremacy. Um, and, you know, generally, non-white people and white people get pretty riled up about that. But they were very calm. They just wanted to talk about it. And so we stayed and talked for another 30, 40 minutes. Um, and then this was on Wednesday, by the way, of this week. I stayed, talked two days later yesterday, bumped into this group of students again. Uh, and we hung out and talked about racism, white supremacy for about another 40 minutes to an hour. And uh, I was told that some of these students actually wanted us to come back to continue the dialogue. Um, so I'm saying all that to set up. Um, it is very possible. In fact, one of the white students who's in this class uh, agreed that she would be willing to come on the show uh, talk about racism, white supremacy, and she said she actually is uh, in a sexual relationship with a non-white person. So that uh, should be very interesting. I'm very much looking forward to having her on the program as um, soon as possible. Uh, also, this class, they do a performance at the end of the quarter, which should be 
uh, about the first or second week in June. But they do a performance where they kind of put together their skits and presentations based on what they've learned during the course. Um, I very much am looking forward to attending this program. I've gone the last two years. Um, I actually participated uh, two years ago, so I'm very much looking forward to participating in this program, um, or at least you know going to check it out. And then they do an after party, and I told them yesterday I would like to do a show live from the after party and just kind of get honest feedback from the students about what they think about this course, rethinking diversity. Uh, and their honest views on racism, white supremacy. I was told that many of the white students uh, were not pleased. They were upset about things that we had to say uh, during the presentation. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, getting all this taken care of and, and doing a live show from the after party. Uh, I will be posting about this to let people know. Definitely something you want to check out. I suspect it will be very late. Uh, if this is a live show, it will probably be uh, 2 o'clock East Coast time, um, 11 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So probably be a very late broadcast, but I suspect this will be a very interesting show uh, once we get ready to pull this off. Um, but, yeah, that's stuff coming down the road. Definitely want to check that out. You can investigate this yourself if you are interested. This class, as I said, Rethinking Diversity It is uh, – in the CHID department at the University of Washington, and CHID is Comparative History of Ideas. Very, very interesting. Uh, you can uh, go online, as I said, uh, University of Washington. If you put in University of Washington and CHID, C-H-I-D, if you search that, if you do a Google search on it, I'm very certain it will pop up. You'll be able to locate it, uh, and you'll be able to get more information about this program and, uh, yeah, see what CHID means. They define all that. What's the purpose of this department? I'm sure you'll even be able to find uh, information about the class specifically. Uh, but, yeah, more of this will be coming down the road, and hopefully there, there will be some uh, shows that I do dealing with this directly. Um, yeah, also, please make sure you check out my blog after I've plugged everyone else's sites. Uh, please check out my blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com. Dot com uh, again racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com I have a uh, counter racist film review for Pulp Fiction uh, almost finished it up just had a very busy week and was not able to uh, get to it as I wanted to but hopefully I'll be able to uh, pull that off and get that up as soon as possible within the next one or two days um, get that taken care of um, actually I'm still waiting. Dr. Eddie Moore, Jr. has still uh, not given me a call. I'm not sure um, what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, I'm going to take a brief pause and see if I can give him a jingle. Um, I'm going to play, give myself a brief uh, interlude so that I can make that call and see uh, what Dr. Moore is up to, if he's going to be able to uh, give us a ring and participate in the program. If not, I'm going to see if I can dig up another treat for us on this edition of The Cow's Context of White Supremacy. So hang tight. I appreciate you all being patient. And we will see what's up with Dr. Moore, and I will be right back.
Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Excuse me, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Um, gracious enough, allow me to uh, record this. I will make sure that you get a copy, sir. Um, Mr. Fuller, I uh, just spoke with some white people earlier in the week, and I was speaking with these white people, and I asked them. I was talking about racist jokes, and I asked the white people if they had heard any racist jokes before, and every white person said, yes, oh, yeah, I've heard some racist jokes before. And I said, okay, um, would you say that racists, that they assume if you are a white person that you're racist? All of the white people in the class said, yes, no hesitation, you know, quick, uh, as soon as I asked the question, everybody said yes. I said, okay. And they said yes to what question? Do racists assume that if you are white, you are racist? Every white person in the class said yes. Oh, and I, okay. And I said, wow. And we have this on videotape. Uh, we recorded this. Uh, I said, okay. So logically, if I'm a non-white person, and a victim of white supremacy, um, should I assume that if you're white, you're racist? And they all said yes. I said, wow, I thought that was very interesting. Um, I don't know. What, what's your view on that? Well, the codified position is it's best for the victim to use the term racist suspect mm -hmm. based on if the person is able to be one, you suspect that the person most likely is one because of the overriding system of white supremacy itself. It's the most pervasive system on the planet. It's the most influential system on the planet, meaning the system of white supremacy, which means white people mistreating deliberately and intentionally non-white people based on the color of the non-white people. That's what white supremacy is. It's about mistreatment. And so that is the most powerful system on the planet, political system and religious system. No political system, no religious system is more powerful than that system. So someone has to be a racist. So since... People don't walk around with a sign on them as a practical thing and as a uh, ordinary thing, or whatever you want to call it, saying, I am a racist, then that means you have to guess. Um, people don't carry it in some card in their pocket where if they apply for a job, would not say, you know, uh, and got a check mark by. Yes, I'm a racist, you know, male or female, and what's their name, what's their address. And it'll say something about what their race is, maybe, some identification, but it won't say whether or not they're racist. So since that is something that's not on paper about the person that you pass on the street, then you just have to guess. And if you're a victim of racism, it's best to guess that the person may be a racist because the person is able to be one. Because it, it's not a matter of just a handful of people, just a few people. It's a huge population of people who practice racism in the form of white supremacy. So therefore, any white person who is able to be one could be one. It's like you hear the term, you know, well, we've got a lot of terrorism going on, you know. Or the average person, there's just some things, uh, you know, they, they say that, you know, you know, never can tell when the terrorists might be among you. And then on a broader sense, they'll say you never can tell when a person might be a, a thief. Mm -hmm. You know, let's put it that way. And they say, well, uh, you've got all these locks on the doors. It seems like everybody has a lock on their door. Everybody has a lock on their car. And they have uh, devices to deter people from stealing a car. Well, why is that? Because the assumption is that you've got a lot of people who will steal. 
That's just an automatic assumption. It's got a lock on the door because, hey, if I didn't have a lock on the door, people would come in here and take stuff. You know? It's a deterrent. I have a, a club on my steering wheel, or I got a, an alarm system in my house and on my car. Why? Because people will steal. Whoa, well, now, what do you mean? You know, you mean to tell me that people might steal? Yes, people might steal. Well, what people? Well, who knows? <laughs> See what I mean? Yes, sir. So when you yes, come sir. to racism, it's the same thing. They say racism does exist. Racism is powerful. Racism is something that's been with us a long time. Racism is something that you have to fight all the time. You have to be on your guard about it. So you can't have racism that you've got to be on guard about unless somebody is a racist. And it must be a whole lot of people, just like they assume that a whole lot of people might steal your car if it's sitting there with the windows down and the keys in the ignition. A whole lot of people might steal your car. Now, who are they? You don't know. But that's an assumption that you make. So you make the same assumption. I'm around a lot of white people now. Somebody here probably is a racist. And it goes farther than that. Whoever in here, if it's just ten people in the room, one person is non-white, the other nine are white. And it might be just one white person in there who is a racist. According to counter-racist logic, that's the most powerful person in that room. Why is that? Because they have a whole army behind them to back up what they do and say. That's what makes them powerful. As an individual person, no. But they have a connection with an army. A white person is a racist. They got a lot of people that they can depend on to back up their racism. And these people are also racist. The most powerful army in the world. The army of white supremacists. That's the name of it. Uh, Mr. Fuller, when I have spoken with different non-white people, uh, victims of racism, white supremacy, um, I have suggested that non-white people, they are suspicious of any white person uh, who is able to practice racism as a minimum. And they have said that that's really hard. Uh, I tell non-white people, you know, four things that non-white people can do that would, you know, I think be extremely constructive in combating racism, white supremacy, uh, not mistreating other non-white people, uh, not engaging in sexual intercourse with not white people. Not mistreating anyone. Y- yes, sir. That's where yes, we're sir. supposed to be going. Yes, sir. Um, not engaging in sexual intercourse with white people as long as the system of white supremacy exists. Um, really making an effort to refine and become very precise with the use of words when you discuss racism, white supremacy, and being suspicious of any white person who is able to be a racist white supremacist. And they will say, out of those four, the most difficult thing is to be suspicious of white people. And I've even had white people Admitted racists come in and say, yes, you should be suspicious of any white person. Yes, that would be constructive. Non-white people worldwide should be suspicious of white people. And the non-white people still say, wow, that's really hard. I don't know if I can do that. That means I have to be suspicious of my neighbor or suspicious of my boss who's a white person. Uh, Why do you think non-white people have such a difficult time um, being suspicious of white people, even if they admit that we're in a system of white supremacy? One logical answer, it shows the efficiency of the system of white supremacy. Hmm. Efficiency. If you are a master deceiver, Hmm. a master spy, a master operator, 
and the people who are around you are not suspicious of you being just that, it means that you, that is proof itself that you are a master of what you do. Hmm. Wow. You don't give any, any indication. A master spy gives absolutely no indication at all that he or she is a spy. Otherwise, you fail the test of being a spy if you arouse suspicion. Hmm. Wow. Uh, the people okay. who are called Indians, Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there's an old traditional saying. I mean, it's almost a cliche is that speaks with forked tongue. Say one thing, mean another. Very deceptive. That if you start trusting them, you drop your guard, you've been had. You're talking about white people. That's an old Indian saying, forked tongue. Mm-hmm. Very, very shrewd. They'll confuse you. Say one thing, mean another. Make your head hurt. The the way that you are speaking about the white people who practice racism, white supremacy, is as though these people are very conscious of what they are doing and very methodical about how they practice racism, white supremacy. Uh, It's been my experience that many non-white people think that the problem is that white people are just not aware of racism, that that's the problem, that we need to educate, we being non-white people, the victims of white supremacy, we need to inform white people that racism exists and it's hurting us. Uh, What would you say to that? You can do that. See, if if I'm the one who is inflicting the pain, I can, you know, uh, if if let's just say that I'm operating a machine, and it's two sides to the machine. Now, every time I do whatever I do on the side that I'm on, the other person is hurt by what's happening on the other side of the machine. I'm talking about a machine in a factory or whatever. If I'm turning a wheel on one side of the machine and turn it with ease, I mean, I can do it so easily, I mean, that I can yawn while I'm doing it. And the other person on the other side is having something that, a part of the machine that punches them in the gut. All right? Now, they're over there hurting like all get out. And you might say, The system of white supremacy operates just like a machine. So it's only when you really start being really disruptive over there, not just feeling the pain. You start throwing things over the top of the machine and they start hitting me. Then, even though that I know that you might be having a hard time over there, it's only then that I might stop turning that wheel. Hmm. Otherwise, it's just business as usual. You just keep hurting. But if you just can't stand it anymore, just start throwing tin cans or whatever you can get your hand on over the top of the machine, lunch buckets or whatever, and it starts raining down on my head, (laughs) then my attitude, quote, unquote, might be, what in the world is wrong with you over there? Well, what the world is wrong with me over here is that every time you turn that wheel, there's a part of that machine coming from your side that punches me in the gut. Hard enough to knock me down. And it does it every three seconds. I can't take it anymore. Uh, Mr. Fuller, 
Um, I have heard you say before that white people cannot be ignorant about racism. Um, just using the same example, would that mean that white people... Oh, yeah, a person tells me, that, that's what I'm saying, if you'll just allow me to interject this, going back to the machine again, yes, I've sir. been told, hey, the other side of that machine is rough, so you want to work on the side that turns the wheel. So I say, well, what do you mean by rough? Well, whoever's on the other side, I mean, is operating that side, I mean, they're going to get punched in the gut. But you're just going to breeze along. I say, yeah, I'll take the job where I just breeze along. Say, well, what about the fellow who was on the side? Well, you know, y'all, y'all take care of that, whatever. You know. <laughs> I, I have uh, I have spoken with um, at many white people about this and asking them if they think it's true that white people cannot be ignorant of racism. And I know specifically with uh, the admitted white supremacist known as Farrell Winfrey. Uh, I asked her, and she said, that is incorrect. She said she, she is familiar with your work, and she has a lot of respect for what you do, but I don't believe that that's true. Uh, later when I was speaking with her, I asked her, if white people, if you are white, you have to know what the criterion is for determining who is white and who is not white. And she said, yes, that is true. And I said, on that basis, if you're white, you know who the white people are. She said, yes, that's true. And I said, so just based on what you said right there, white people have to be more informed about racism, white supremacy, than the non-white people, because non-white people don't know how to determine who's white, who's not white. White people who practice racism know that. And she said, yes, that's true. And I not said, only that, they're going to determine who's white and who's not white. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you're a white supremacist, you have that kind of uh, uh, authority. Yes, sir. In fact, you are the only person who has that authority. Hmm. Now, black people can stand up and say, well, this, this person, you know, this person is uh, uh, not white, and that has actually happened. There are case laws of that in so-called South Africa. There was a one one case that I remember is that there was an... Uh, a uh, boxer, I forgot his name, in South Africa, who was classified as white. And then later on, when they were taking a resurvey of everybody who was supposed to be white and not white, they came along and told him that they had some research done and that he was not white. And... uh then they went through his entire family, if I recall correctly, and say, oh, well, now, some members of your family are so light that there's no way in the world that we can't classify them as white. In other words, we have to classify them as white, even though we have classified you as non-white. So what they did was split up the family. Hmm. They made him move. <laughs> wow. To uh, what they call the Cape Colors. Because they had three classifications, maybe more. But they put him with what they call the colored section, which is somewhere between black and white. And they made him move and made some members of his family move and left the others over there as white people. Also, the other thing that they had was under what they call, quote, unquote, apartheid, which is just a more restrictive and more clear, clearly defined uh, subsystem, you might say, a parallel system, or more intensified system of white supremacy, more in-your-face type. Uh, the people who are called Japanese, now any of them that came from Japan on business, they were classified as white for the time that they are there doing business. But a Japanese who had family members born and raised in South Africa were classified as non-white. 
even though they're all members of the same family. They were the ones born here. Now, all, all those, you know, they're you're all family members. You can come visit your family and all like that, but if you're here on business, you will be white during the time that you're just here. You're here on a visa, you know, on a passport. And because you'll just be here six months. For that six months, you can, you know, you're a white person because you don't live here. But now if you settle down here, you're going to be immediately booked as non-white. That was the way they, you know, it's control. Mm-hmm. In in the system, See, black people uh, in this area of the world, we think it's all an emotional thing. It's a business. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. In the system of white supremacy, would you say then that if a white person is classifying individuals as white and non-white, that that in itself is an act of white supremacy to classify people as white and non-white. It's a result. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a result. It's a part of. It's it's an integral part of the system. You got to classify people. Okay. Yeah. When you anytime you say, say you're going to take a census, what is the purpose for classifying people by color? It's to practice racism. And what is racism? Mistreatment of people based on color. That's all it's good for. It's not good for anything else. It's nothing can anybody can say that is good for other than that. Well, wait, now, if you, talk people, about, if you talk about uh, color preservation, mm. that's something else. That's color preservation. That's just like, you know, you've got purple flowers, and you say, well, we, you know, we, we, we need some more uh, uh, orange. We, we want, we'd like to have some more orange flowers and whatnot. Say, we've got enough purple seeds, I mean, for the purple flowers. We need some orange flowers. So that's, that is, hey, no problem there. See what I mean? Yes, sir. But when you set up a system of racism, it's not just about distinguishing one color from another. Like some white people will say, well, I don't see your color. Well, I've been saying for years, and, and Tony Brown and a lot of other people have been saying, what do you mean you don't see my color? You can see that a tree is green. Don't you see that a tree is green, you know, <laughs> that the leaves on the tree are green? And then later on they turn brown, and they may turn orange or, you know, or whatever. Yeah, and you're supposed to see that. You're not supposed to ignore that. I mean, that's a part of the whole idea. You see it. You know? Colors are. I say that in the textbook. There's no such thing as a wrong color. Colors are. It's how you react to it when it comes to people or things or whatever. Now, if you just go around and say, well... If I ever see a red box car, all the red box cars, I'm gonna set on fire. See what I mean? Yes, sir. Now you're going. Oh, you, you, you. Well, why are you setting them on fire? Well, I just don't like red box cars. <laughs> well, now this is my railroad, and some of my box cars are red. Some of them are blue. Some of them are black. Some of them are green. Because I chose to make them that way. Now you gonna burn up my box cars? Because you don't like the red ones? Yep. Well, you got a problem with me in my railroad. <laughs> See, but somebody thought up the idea that, oh, those are some people over there that they got a color that's different from mine, so that gives me a license to mistreat them. And whoever thought up that idea, thought up the most powerful political and religious idea ever for mistreating people. Nothing has done more to mistreat people than that idea. Well, I've heard people say, you know, taking the census and keeping track of color and racial classification, that's a good thing because I want to know, you know, if I'm a so-called Pacific Islander, I want to know if there are a lot of Pacific Islanders in this area because that, you know, that might mean that there's more of my culture in this area, or if I'm a Native American, it'll be good for me to know if there are a lot of Native Americans in this area because 
I want to be around a lot of people who are like me. Uh, what would you say you know, about that if they say, well, that's... It has nothing to do with color unless you make it something to do with color. That's exactly what I'm talking about. People start talking about culture or ethnicity mm-hmm. when you started off talking about color. See, that's a trick. They jump from one thing to another. Well, and then, see, when you ask about a culture, mm-hmm. culture is what people do at the time that they're doing it. That's all anybody's culture is, what you're doing at the time that you're doing it. If I'm riding freight trains, that's my culture. Hmm. They say, well, you're a hobo. I'm a hobo while I'm on the freight train hoboing. The minute I jump off that train, I'm no longer a hobo. Because I'm not on the train. The very second that I do that, They say, yeah, but traditionally you're a hobo and all that. Traditionally, I'm a lot of things. I'm my mother's son. That's a tradition. So what ethnic group do I belong in when it comes to that? Every mother who got a son. Okay? (laughs) Yeah, that's the way that works. That's why I say when people start talking about where they are from, codified response is, Codified response, according to counter-racist logic and compensatory logic, is I'm from everywhere I've ever been and everywhere I've never been. And that is the truth. First to say, oh, well, I'm from, you know, I'm, 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 I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I'm originally from Africa. I'm originally from this. I, You don't know where you are originally from unless you know where every molecule in the universe came from. That's the only way you can say anything in truth about where you, quote, unquote, originated. If you're going to tell the truth and not make up something. If you came out of that next room that you're in, You're from that next room. I'm from everywhere I've ever been, and I'm from everywhere I've never been. Why? Because I'm from there. I'm not there. That not only includes everywhere I've ever been, that includes all the places I've never been. I'm from the moon because I've never been there. As far as I know, anyway. <laughs> I, I was uh, from the sure. other side of all of the universes that ever ever existed. Could be, hmm. but I can't point to all the molecules that went into my making and where they originated. What was the first molecule that was crafted that wound up a million years later in my body? What do I know about that? There's no way that I can trace my history. Because my history is everything that ever happened before the beginning of time and since. And that's the truth. Uh, I was curious. um, Your book, uh, The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, uh, your book has been out for some time now. Uh, I know Dr. Welsing and her book has been out for some time now. Um, in all the years that you have been doing counter-racist work and Dr. Welsing and other people who are familiar, uh, some have some level of familiarity with counter-racism, um, why do you think more non-white people have not made an effort to write books or do something to spread the word and inform more victims of racism about counter-racism. So indoctrinated and thinking inside the box that they don't even know that they're thinking inside the box. What, what do you mean when you and, say thinking? Well, well I, just give you, I just gave you some illustrations. Mm-hmm. My history is everything that ever happened. How many people will say that, that you would meet anywhere? 
quite a few. But that's or, the truth. Me, not many. That is the truth that would apply to anybody or anything. That's that's the truth that would apply to uh, uh, a parrot sitting on a limb in Australia. The history of that pilot, pirate, that parrot, that sparrow that's flying through the air right now, of which there are millions of them. The history of that sparrow is everything that ever happened since the beginning of time and before the beginning of time. That's the history of that sparrow, and that is the truth. Um, I Your know. history is something that happened two seconds ago, one second ago, one fraction of a second ago. Happened where? Anywhere. Because you are here. So anything that happens before you are here is your history. Can't be anything else but that. But what the white supremacists have done an excellent job of is putting everything in a box. Saying, oh, that's not your history. That's my history. Being very selective and chopping everything up. Hmm. Like they do saying the Mexicans are coming to America. Mm. Now, it's one thing that they do this right in your face, but college professors can't even comprehend it, even when you tell them that and point it out, and even when they are talking about it themselves. They miss it. They miss it. Geography professor standing right there repeating something that makes no sense at all saying the Mexicans are coming to America. And Mexicans themselves, many of them will say, well, we're going to America. We're bundling up and every whatnot, and we're going to El Paso. And we're going to try to cross the border into America. People from Guatemala, Honduras will say that. But even with the artificial ality, because there's nothing in nature that says this. It's purely an imaginary construct. But even when an artist draws a map and says, now, this is America. And then right under it, they'll say, now, right under America, North America is Central America. That would include the people from Guatemala and all that. Mm. And then right below that, they'll say this is South America. And so, actually, the fellow from Honduras who crosses a so-called border where there's nothing there in nature that says that's a border, that's just some signs that somebody put up, which you can make and put up anywhere, you know. I can put up a sign in the middle of Rhode Island and say, you're now crossing the Alps. <laughs> Why? Because you know, the person will come along and say, hey, we're crossing the Alps. <laughs> Why? Because the sign said so. <laughs> and I sit there right by the sign and say, dummy. <laughs> Yeah, now he thinks he's in Switzerland. <laughs> Why? Because I said so. <laughs> I just put it on the sign. Uh, I'll have a sandwich in afternoon. I'm going to put North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you feel the guy comes? The same guy comes right past there. She looks at the sign. Oh man, I didn't know we were that close to the North Pole. <laughs> I say, yeah, I know you didn't know it until I told you. <laughs> Welcome to the North Pole. <laughs> do you think racist? Now it's uh, 110 degrees, you know, in the shade, and I'm telling him I'm selling overcoats. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to freeze to death because you're at the North Pole. <laughs> and he just nods his head and shakes it and scratches it <laughs> and buys my coats. 
Do you believe uh, racists do things like this all the time? They uh, do it all day long. Hmm. Put some bling bling around your neck and tell you you're rich. Hmm. Hmm. You see, how much is this worth? Because you don't know. Oh, this is <laughs> worth ten zillion dollars. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. You don't believe it? Ask my buddy here. <laughs> I was. Uh, I know a lot of non-white people who are familiar with counter-racism. Um, it's been my experience that many of them do not talk to white people um, about racism, white supremacy. They study uh, counter-racism and they end up doing a lot of talking and debating with other victims. And it's been my experience that I feel I have learned a lot more and really been able to use counter-racism effectively when I have been using it to talk to white people. Um, I don't know, has that been your experience, and do you think uh, that not the victims of racism should really make an effort to use their counter-racist techniques in speaking with white people, suspected racists? That's how you learn. Mm-hmm. Black people talk most, mostly to each other in order to, uh, to argue. That's really why they're talking. They don't know this, but that's why they're talking. They're not trying to learn nothing. They're not, you know, they're just trying to, like I said in the book, uh, show offism. They're trying to show how much they have learned from white people. But they're trying to show it to another black person because it doesn't make sense to show it to a white person. Because that's, mm-hmm. just, who, that's just who told them. What do you think a black person is doing when they walk around waving their degree? I hear some black uh, professors and whatnot. I mean, stand up talking about, you know, how much they have learned, you know, and how degreed they are and all like that. And then turn right around and start talking about dumb white folks. And that's who gave them their degree. They came a long distance, some of them all the way from Nigeria someplace, trying to learn. Learn from who? Me? No, they passed right by me. Now, that's the one intelligence that they have. <laughs> how many black people what, how many uh, black people do you see? And I'll go further than that. How many white people do you see? following black people all over the world trying to learn how to get to the moon. That's not where you go. Doesn't work. Anybody who will tell the truth know that don't work. I know some non-white people who would say there are white people who are not smart. Uh, I, in fact, just heard a whole lot of them, and they are correct. I'm going to join right in before you even go that way. He has a whole lot of white people who mm-hmm. don't know a whole lot of things. But mm-hmm. you, you know what? Under the system of white supremacy, they know enough. Because they don't have to know. And what is that enough? Something I heard a white woman say one time. <laughs> bunch of black people were, were laughing at her because they was laughing at the way that she dressed. Mm-hmm. He was talking about how tacky she was at the way that she dressed. This was on a job that I was on. Mm-hmm. They were getting on the elevator, and they were just they were cracking up at the way that she was dressed because she was dressed in what most people would say in an outlandish manner, just outlandish, okay, like she had gone out of her way to attract a whole lot of Laughter, okay. But she heard them laughing at her. And she turned around and said one thing. Yes, but I'm white. And walked off. <laughs> wow. In other words, y'all can laugh at me and dress in all your fine clothes and all like that but I can do things that you will never do in your entire life. 
I can wow. go places. I got connections that you will never have. No matter your children will never have. That's what she was saying. That was back in the sixties. Those black people on that elevator got dead quiet. Wow. Because they knew that she was telling the truth. Say, yeah, I can dress any cotton picking way I want to. <laughs> but you got no right to laugh at me. Because when you look at my overall circumstances and yours, no contest. <laughs> That's what she was saying wow. in just that one statement. Now, she didn't say all that. She just made one statement. But I was standing nearby. I knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but I'm white, you know. I don't have to dress no kind of way. I don't even have to have clothes on. I'm, st- I'm still in a league better than you. I got connections better than you'll ever have. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. So the, all y'all on that elevator, I mean, this... Get on it, close the door, and go straight to the ghetto. <laughs> wow. So a non-white person, they say, well, you know, Mr. Uh, excuse me, President Obama, he is clearly a non-white person. Uh, there is a white person who is working at Wendy's, making minimum wage, struggling. You are not going to tell me that President Obama is inferior to that white person that President Obama is uh, less than that white person working at Wendy's. What would you say to that? I would say he's still under the system of white supremacy and is the white supremacist, according to Mr. Obama himself. He wouldn't have that job. You're saying if it was not for the white people who practice racism, white supremacy, Mr. President Obama would not be in the White House? If, if any black person who forgets that is getting a very, forgetting a very important fundamental, he couldn't even been running. His name would have been not been known. He wouldn't have had a white mother in Kansas who could teach him anything if the white supremacists had not agreed to that. See, I'm talking about white supremacy, thinking about it in depth, not just on the surface. There are a lot of black people just think he just walked in there and say, hey, I'm a black, I'm a president, I'm, I'm going to be president, and I'm going to be president because I want to be president, and it don't make no difference what you white people think. He didn't walk in there like that. When he was campaigning, he said, I'm asking you all to help me. And white people came out in Springfield, Illinois, by the thousands, and took a look at him. And say, you know what? I think I give this boy a chance, mm. you know, to go through the training that we have given him, you know. Because, yeah, you know, and like Mr. Obama himself said, you know, in four years you can snatch me out of here anyway. They can snatch him out of there before four years. Mm. Yeah, they can, they can, he can give up that seat tomorrow if the white people decide, hey, that's right. <laughs> He'll walk right in there, right in the middle of all them papers that are stacked up on his desk. And he's trying to solve problems and all like that. And they walk right in there and they tell him, hey, just like the mafioso, the organized crime, which is what white supremacy is. They just walk in and say, hey, you know, we made a decision this morning. You out of here. We got a janitor's job for you at Union Station. <laughs> and that's where he will be. He came to work at nine at ten. He's down there putting on his janitor's cap and drawing his equipment out of the storage room for buffing floors. First black president photograph of it. You know how Mr. Obama looks. Yes, sir. He can look the same way, smiling, behind a broom in Union Station in Springfield, Illinois, or whatever the train station is there. You say, how did you go from president to here? White people decided it. (laughs) 
Say, well, what do the black people think about that? Well, who cares? <laughs> they better try to hold on to that janitor's job they got if they got one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, who does the hiring and firing all over the world? Well, I don't know. The Chinese built a three gorgeous dam with permission. I'm going to show you just how far that goes. They ain't building no dam nowhere without permission. Permission from whom? The white supremacists, that's who. Wow. Because they know how to disrupt dam building or anything else you're trying to put up. Well, I got a nice house. Step out your door the next day. Big sign there, say foreclosure. Hmm. Well, they can't do that. Oh, yeah. You better be out of here day after tomorrow. <laughs> but that ain't right. I'm not talking about right. I never told you anything about right, <laughs> except when I tell you what's right. White is right. Hmm. <laughs> It's against the law. I make the law. Have you heard? I am the law. In the old days, black people understood that. Really? Sure, because we would look up and we would say, hey, here come the law. Mm. I don't see no badge. Hey. <laughs> That's a white man walking through the ghetto, man. That's the law. <laughs> wow. How do you think that was lost? Because, Well, let me ask. Are you saying then that uh, in previously non-white people in this area of the world had a better understanding of the power? Yes, because it was in your face. There was a sign hanging up everywhere. Hmm. You go looking for the sign. Anytime you, you, know, you walk into a place and you see some white people around, you would look for the sign saying where you're supposed to be. Mm. So there's, one, there's one hanging up there somewhere. Hmm. Wow. If you wanted to drink a water, I mean, you know, you look for the sign. You ain't going to drink water anywhere. In a restroom, forget it. <laughs> Probably won't be one. Big sign on that, too, for whites only. I had a... Get on a train, same thing. Where's the colored section? Don't you know, boy? Go to the last car. The last car is a half mile down the track. Go to the last car if you want to ride the train. <laughs> You got two minutes to see if you can do a Jesse Owens down there. But we leaving. <laughs> wow. You and your grandmother too, and she's on crutches. Wow. She better learn how to run like Jesse. <laughs> Who was also a victim of white supremacy. Absolutely. Hitler said that. Mm. Call him an animal. When, when wow. Jesse Owens ran around that track and beat everybody doing it, Hitler said, hey, that's that, that, that's that's not even in the rules. <laughs> so you matching, you matching, you know, a person with an animal. Wow. Yeah, if you put a horse out there, I mean, you expect a horse to run faster. Right. But a horse is a horse. And a nigga is the same as a horse. You know, you ride him and beat him, you know. <laughs> Wow. Wow. I, I had a uh, suspected racist. Uh, I spoke with him last week, uh, Michael Bradley. Uh, he's the author yeah. of uh, The Iceman Inheritance. And right. uh, he said, white people, I thought this was interesting because he did not say this in his book, but he said, white people are not going to stop practicing white supremacy. Uh, he said they're not going to change their behavior 
uh, and I actually have had quite a few white people say this. Uh, Farrah Winfrey actually said the same thing. She said uh, a, a non-white person was asking her uh, about what can be done to change white people's behavior, and she responded with a question. She said, well, why should we change? And it was kind of the same response that you witnessed on the elevator. There was kind of a hush that fell over the non-white people. And I have, you know, presented this to non-white people repeatedly and saying, really, white people don't really have a reason to change their behavior. They can do whatever they want anywhere on the planet or any other planet. Why should they change their behavior? Do you think white people sure. are going Sure. I mean, it's like, you know, a person, you know, when some non-white people come here, one of the first things they are told when they come to this area of the world, they haven't been around uh, white people, uh, you know, uh, and whatnot, and where they come from, they just look at, you know, it's mostly around on a day-to-day level, people that look like them, but so they are non-white. So they come here, so they'll tell now, hey, stay, the darker the people, stay away from them, you know, because they are they're classified, you know, their classification is in the derogatory classification here, traditionally, hmm. you know. So a lot of black people got to get a thing, you know. Some of these people ain't got here, they just got here yesterday, and they got an attitude and whatnot. Well, naturally, because they've been told. They say, you're not going to get any benefits hanging around them. And what little benefits you do get, they're going to be taken away from you if you're hanging around these people. Mm-hmm. So naturally, that you know, a person just says, "Well, I don't want you know. I came here for opportunity. I'm not looking to make my bad situation worse. Mm-hmm. So if you're telling me to stay away from, you know, people who are considered to be in the non-opportunity group, and naturally, I'm not going to be favorable toward them. You know, I don't want them to speak to me. I don't want to be seen speaking to them. You know." That's the rules. You're looking for opportunity. Now, if you want to hurt your chances, hang out with them. So non-white people shouldn't get angry with them. Our opposition should be directed toward the people who told them that. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the way that works. But the racists know that. They know that we have that knee-jerk reaction. To fuss with the other non-white person. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That dude just got here from Guam, man. He got an attitude. Man, you know, he, he walking around here dark as he is. And, 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 and you know, just want to be hanging out with the white folks and whatnot. Don't want to be with us. But see, he can ask a legitimate question. I came here for opportunity. Are there any opportunities that you can offer? And we have to tell the truth and say no. <laughs> say, well, what's the point in hanging with you? Other than to hang with you at the end of a rope. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Do you think then it would be because All they're saying is, hey, I can be miserable by myself. I was miserable where I came from. <laughs> mm. I don't want to be more miserable than I was there. <laughs> I could have stayed where I was and be miserable. <laughs> so do you think I then... I do it, nothing but just stand on the corner and try to sell some drugs you know, and, and outrun the patrol car when it comes around. That's what I see y'all doing. <laughs> you know, yeah, I could have stayed where I was and been better off than that. <laughs> right. Do you think then it would be constructive if non-white people in this area of the world uh, adopted the same mindset that, you know, non-white people don't really have a lot of resources, uh, they don't really have as much information as the white people, uh, I'm really going to make, uh, I'm going to minimize the amount of contact that I have with non-white people just on that basis alone and make an effort to interact with white people since they have more information, more resources, unless that non-white person has constructive information, constructive resources. Do you think that would be Absolutely. A that's, what, that's what my book is about. I say that specifically. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about some non-white people that come from somewhere else recently. I'm mm. talking about non-white people that live right next door. Yes, if they ain't about nothing constructive, what's the point? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you come over and visit us? They all sitting over there drunk every day. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting. No. <laughs> what you can tell them, hey, now when you all start doing something constructive, or when you give some have some constructive information for me, or something that will help to do anything constructive, let me know. I come over here every day, you know, because I'm looking for improvement. Y'all want me to just feel bad, you know, like y'all feeling bad and not trying to do nothing about it. I can do that by myself. I don't need to consolidate my misery. I need to get out of it. (laughs) Come over here and feel bad with us. (laughs) You know? Sit up here and snort, snort coke all day and feel bad, and then feel good enough to start fighting each other. Mm. Come over here and help us do it. <laughs> Get right in it. <laughs> no, man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want that, and you shouldn't want it. <laughs> man, what, what what kind of proposition is that? <laughs> well, we'll all be together. We was together on the slave ship. But anybody who can get off that ship should. <laughs> Dog gone. Don't try to leave the ship, man, because we all here. <laughs> Don't you want to be with us? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, when you got caught, I was trying to outrun. I mean, I stumbled over you. That's how I got caught. <laughs> I wanted to, you said earlier that non-white people uh, under the system of white supremacy are conditioned when they have contact with other non-white people. They are conditioned to argue with each other, whether they know it or not. We ain't going to argue until we find each other. Wow. We ain't going to argue with nobody else. You think the evidence shows that, that non-white people? Yeah, the evidence shows that. And then we intend for the argument to balloon into a fight and the fight to balloon into some killing. That's why you see all that yellow tape where we are. Yellow tape and blinking lights. Hmm. As soon as the sun goes down. Sometimes before. And you think non-white people, uh, they are not conditioned and do not show these same uh, tendencies when they have contact with white people? Because they better not. We don't do the same things, and we're not telling the truth if we say so. No. Hmm. Hmm. Whole lot of places, non-white people are just, you know. Hey, MF, what you looking at? He ain't saying that to that white guy. The white guy been staring at him for the last fifteen minutes. Depends on where they are. A lot of white guys, I mean, will answer, you know. <laughs> I mean, in a very simple, what you might call moderately uh, um, mild-mannered, you know, way of doing. Say, well, I'm looking at you because uh, you're not acting civilized, buddy. Be looking have, right in the eye when he does it. <laughs> mm, I, I have actually witnessed that. Uh, there was yeah. a, a television show that made a joke about that and showed a non-white person bumping into another non-white person, and a big argument ensued and a fight. And the same, and then they showed a non-white person bumping into a white person, mm. and the non-white person got upset, and the white person just looked at him, laughed, and walked away. I mm-hmm. have seen that happen uh, in mm-hmm. real life, where the non-white mm-hmm. person was cursing, jumping up and yeah. down, stomping yeah. them, I mean, just yeah. acting a fool. The white person looked at them, 
laughed, and walked away. Uh, yeah, out, <laughs> I mean, in, out in the middle of the desert on a one-on-one, I mean, uh, the black person will, I mean, hey, he'll take charge. But see, in the middle of a city, at high noon, and all like that, walking to the bank, his whole demeanor is different. Mm. People in there in the office building, he's, his, his demeanor is different than it is out in front in that parking lot you know, in the hood, in front of the Seven Eleven, around nothing but people walking around with their pants hanging down. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean he'll get violent right quick. But how come he don't do the same thing when he's right in the heart of town? You know, surrounded by a sea of white people. And the white guy's staring at him. He ain't saying nothing to him. He feels naked, really. He can't wait to get on that bus and get to the other side of town where he can where he can feel like, you know, now I can be me. <laughs> I got to put on an act when I'm, you know. <laughs> I, that, I, act that, you, that act that you were putting on, that was the best part of your act, <laughs> of mm. any act that you conduct when you wow. were acting phony. <laughs> wow. I have heard non-white people say that, that they, um, I, I've known non-white people. I lived in the area of the world known as, as Atlanta, and mm. uh, a lot large population of black people, mm. and I move, I'm in battle now and I talked to black people who live in Seattle in Atlanta and they mm-hmm. said they visited Seattle and they said I could not stay there, I was not comfortable there. It's way too many white people. There are not enough oh, black people. Oh yes, and they and you can ask them why. <laughs> yes. Very important. It's a very important series of statements that they make when they say that. Mm-hmm. And the question would be, oh, why? Why is it that you're uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. And that is peculiar, too, within itself. Because what is in that? many cases, in many cases, where he left, if you're talking about, now if you're not, you're talking about emotional comfort, mm mm-hmm. Yes, they're telling the truth. But if you're talking about actual safety, he's safe. He, he is uncomfortable around a situation where he's most likely safe. Mm. As long as he's not walking up and down the street like he does where he came from, calling everybody he passes the ML. <laughs> That's why he's uncomfortable. He wants to be where he can do that. <laughs> mm. That is one of the main things. It took me about a month to adjust because when I was in Atlanta, I heard not black people. Uh, I heard black people specifically uh, ridiculing and making derisive comments about other black people all day long, every day, and so I don't I don't want to repeat the phrases, but just cursing, uh, just as as they, people would brag, I'll say this: people, black people, would brag about going home and thinking of ways to ridicule and humiliate other black people. They would brag about using their time and energy to do that. And write a song about it. Make yes, a CD sir. if they can. Yes, sir. When I got here, it took about a month before I realized some of the phrases that I heard every day used to humiliate and ridicule other black people. I had not heard at all. I hadn't heard anybody say it. And it was just like, wow, I haven't heard any of these. Na- I mean, it was just stunning, and, and especially when I reflected on how often I would hear these different profanities and things. I mean, you you could not go 
more than an hour without someone being called, you know, just a whole litany of these phrases. Um, and just what you said, hearing black people who were accustomed to that and I, I apparently enjoyed that environment to some degree. And if they that. got it on a CD where somebody else is doing it, they want to go at 3 o'clock in the morning because that's the optimum time and park in the middle of the street if it's not too busy and turn up them amps yes, and open sir. the roof of that vehicle and sit there and give everybody within three blocks a straight dose mm. at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, why are they doing that? Because they wouldn't do that out in the middle of the desert. Because can't nobody hear it but them. That's not the point. They're not trying to hear it. They can hear it without, without all them amps. They want to make sure that you hear it. Three blocks away at 3 o'clock in the morning. All you bitches, all you whores. All you dumbass niggas. <laughs> yep, that that was it. That that has been my experience. Uh, larger. I want to be me. I want to be free. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Do you think uh, non-white people, uh, victims of white supremacy, that they have been conditioned? Uh, to fear white people, and that that is a part of why non-white people are not comfortable being around large numbers of white people or talking to white people? Because they're afraid they might have to stick to doing something halfway constructive. Hmm. And that is painful. When you've been raised up on doing nothing but looking at videos, riding around all day, in a flashy mobile, mm -hmm. bling bling, dark shades, throwing money out of the car, mm -hmm. naked women sitting on top of the car, mm -hmm. playing some sounds about everybody in the world, including the trees and the rocks and the birds of the MF. <laughs> and that's supposed to be paradise. Now, when you have been doing that and looking at that all your life in any other environment, it's a prison. Wow. That you want to get out of as soon as you can. Wow. So I just want to be clear. Walking along a stream with ducks gliding quietly on the water. Flamingos and nothing but the sounds of nature. Dead quiet. It's the same as being in prison. In fact, it's worse than being in prison because in prison everybody's MF and whatnot all day long. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. You have been made systematically into a monster, and you're comfortable being that. Wow. Anything that's the least bit civil, you can't stand it. It's, you, you can't sit still in an employment office regardless of what the employment is going to be. if it's too quiet in there. That's why I say uh, the prison system, the way that it's set up now, that's not the way you get to the black mentality when it's in the thug mode. The way you get to them is not to put them in a cell block with a whole bunch of people that's acting the way that they were acting before they got in there and the way the others are acting before they got in there. You could shorten that sentence at jail time. You All you have to do is just see to it that everybody that you lock up 
I don't call it solitary confinement. I just call it solitude, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you just talk to yourself. You don't have to do that long. Not no 10 years. You do that about six weeks. And they tell you if you come back, at six weeks is going to be six years. See, you do six weeks of talking to nobody. When you come out of there, you're ready to talk to somebody, and you're ready to talk like you've got some sense. Because mm. they, if they tell you, now, hey, if you come back now, at six years, at six weeks, it's going to be six years. And then if you come back again, it's going to be 12. It's going to double every time. Okay? And that's the deal. And that's not, you know, trying to make a, sh- a shield to kill somebody. All day long in the cell block, walking around, I mean, picking a fight and making gang tattoos and gang signs and all like that and try to scheme on how you're going to get some drugs or get a cell phone smuggle in there. Ain't going to be none of that. Mm -hmm. Everybody in here is going to be talking to themselves. So you're going to learn a whole lot about how much you know because you're going to be talking to yourself. There ain't going to be no input of no kind except the input that you brought with you. Um. Now, that's the first six weeks. And the second one, you get a little break. You get books. But that's all you get, books and food. And when you come back the third time, it is triple the time. That you know, third time, now they triple. You know. But always with yourself. And all the books that you get are going to be books that are going to teach you something constructive because you didn't learn the first six weeks that that's what you needed. That's really what you needed, you know. And you say, yeah, but I, before I got in here, I didn't learn to read so well. Well, we'll give you books, I mean, on, you know, reading for dummies, you know. <laughs> Not ridiculing you, not even punishing you, giving you, giving you a chance to think about yourself because you have already proven that that's who you like to think about. You don't like to think about nobody else. That's why you're doing all that stuff while you're out there. Now, I call it compensatory confinement. That's what it needs to be. You're going to make up. See, I mean, all it is is logic. Peter Green used to say that when he went down to Lorton, he he was a person who was here that was kind of notorious in his young days in the streets. He knew everything about the streets, okay, and knew quite a bit about the penitentiary because he was always going. But he said, hey, when he went down to Lorton, which was a penitentiary here at that time, that uh, he kind of halfway looked forward to it because that's where his daddy was. And his daddy was notorious there in the penitentiary. See, when everybody found out he was Petey Green's son, he knew that he, they wasn't going to bother him because they'd have to contend with Petey, okay? Hmm. So he's just going down there joining his dad, plus joining his friends. A whole lot of them were there. They high-fiving right from day one. And that's where a lot of lockups are to a lot of people. That's what they're used to. But one thing that the mind cannot stand, and proof of it is people who join gangs, it's painful not to be able to be somewhere where you can talk to your gang members or talk to somebody. Now, you're talking about something that works on the mind. When you ain't got, when you are in a situation where you can't talk to nobody but yourself, Anybody that's ever been anywhere even in a waiting room when there was nobody else there knows that. I mean, you were thinking about as long as you've been waiting, you're ready to cuss the person out that you came to see, okay? But actually, when they get there, you're so glad to see them and talk to somebody. You've been there four hours and haven't talked to nobody. You're ready to talk to somebody. (laughs) See what I mean? 
Yes, sir. See, when you understand basic psychology, see, they don't know nothing about running prisons. If I was running the prison system, you'd have a whole bunch of people who would reform themselves. Because mm. there's one thing the mind cannot stand, and that is, see, people are social. That's why the guy walks around with his pants down. You think he'd walk around with his pants down in the desert? If day after day after day, he'd find to pull them pants up. See, man, you know, hey, I got to walk around, I mean, just using one hand all day and using the other hand to hold my pants up. What am I doing? <laughs> See, I got to get out of this desert. So I'm going to tighten this belt up so I can use both hands. <laughs> Why? Because there ain't nobody around. The buzzards don't care, except they, you know, hope that he died there so they can eat, eat up him in the pan stew. You know? Wow. Mr. Fuller. That's all it is. All it is. All Logic came with the universe. All you have to do is just use logic. Hmm. Somebody once said that common sense ain't so common. Mm. But as long as they got this this prison system set up like it is, where just all day long, people is in there learning more and more about how to be loud and slick. Wow. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, I know right, I've, heard, I've heard... Uh, many of your, your lectures and, and presentations, and I've read your book as well, uh, I have never heard you use the term uh, white privilege. Um, I was just wanted to ask you about that, why you, you don't use that term, and if you think that is an accurate term to describe what is happening in the system of white supremacy. Because I prefer the term white supremacy. It's more specific, and it describes more. See, it's not just privilege. Privilege kind of sounds like everybody's kind of more or less uh, got a little going, something going for them. Supreme means I'm really in a position of power, not just something that somebody lets me do or, you know, that uh, they got an option or something like that. Privilege kind of sounds that way. Supremacy is a stronger word. I prefer that word because it's more accurate. Do you think white supremacy is a more accurate term to describe? Oh, yes. Okay. Supreme, you know. It's just like the term Supreme Court. It means you can't go no further than this. Hmm. Do you... Uh, See, they expect... don't say privilege court. Hmm. Say, hey, these are supreme... When you get here, as far as the law is concerned, this is it. Once we speak, it doesn't make any difference what anybody else says. Hmm. White supremacy is the same way. Once the white supremacists speak, the only person that can speak that would be listened to at all or have to listen to that person is a person who also has a title of a white supremacist. Hmm. The uh, white people who say that they are anti-racist, um, I, uh, I particularly, as a victim of white supremacy, uh, I don't feel it is correct to use the term anti-racist uh, for a white person or a non-white person under the system of white supremacy uh, because I don't feel there's anything that that white person or the non-white person could do to prove that they're anti-racist. That's the um, part. It's not a matter of your feelings. It's mm -hmm. a matter of uh, you use the term feelings. Yes, sir. The proof of it is no one is proven to be anti-racist simply mm -hmm. because racism still exists. That's it. As long as racism exists, there's no such thing as anti-racism. Mm. See, I say everybody should aspire to be one. I aspire to be a counter-racist and an anti-racist. Mm. 
and a racist eliminator, an eliminator of racism. Mm -hmm. I have not, no one can even charge me accurately with being a counter-racist. They say, well, Neely Fuller is a counter-racist. That's a false charge. Say, well, you're always speaking against racism. Say, yeah, but where do you see the effect? Suppose I, suppose I tell you that I was Jesus. <laughs> you don't see me walk in the water, do you? <laughs> see, you, I, and people can say anything. Where is the, where is the evidence? There's no evidence that racism doesn't exist. So nobody's anti-racist. Not qualified for the title. Do you uh, do you think it would be logical to suspect that uh, white a white person who says I am an admitted white supremacist and I am anti-white supremacist? Do you think it would be logical to suspect that this person is being deceptive with language and perhaps practicing white supremacy? I don't even have to get into it. I assume that the person is a suspected racist simply because racism exists, and they are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that makes uh, Do you think that makes logical sense to say that I am a admitted white supremacist and an anti white supremacist? The second part doesn't compute. Okay. not logical. The second part is not logical. There's no evidence of it. Now, if they're saying they're trying to be, then that's different. Okay. They're either qualified to drive the train or not, you know, or drive the car or whatever it is, ride the skates or whatever. me to announce that I am an airplane pilot, you know. I say, well, you know, uh, are you telling me that you fly an airplane? Yeah, I fly planes. I say, okay, well, I'm going to wait here and see if you're going to be taking off in your plane. And then you come around the corner on a scooter. <laughs> And I say, I thought you told me that you were an airplane pilot. Well, yeah, I'm an airplane pilot, but I'm riding a scooter right now. Well, see, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're a scooter rider. <laughs> Based on what? Evidence. Logic. You haven't shown me, you know, that you can fly an airplane. That's what I mean by people say all kinds of things. What does evidence prove? That's where the logic goes. Some black people will say, I got the solution to the race problem. And the codified question is, if you have the solution, why do I have the problem? I never tell people I got the solution to the race problem. I say I have some suggestions that might work. That's what I put in the book. Suggestions, that's what I call them. I have no proof. Why? Because the problem's still here. Okay, well, I'm going to have to go, unless you've got another very pertinent question that you got to you got to squeeze in. Uh, I, I'm just I'm appreciative uh, for you taking your time. I didn't want to hold you up uh, on a Saturday where you probably have other things to do, sir. Uh, if you could share just uh, for uh, anyone who might listen to this uh, since it's being recorded, if you could share information on how they could get your book, that would be helpful. Okay, people can get my book by calling the. Uh, uh, my phone number, 
And they'll, most of the time, I will respond and uh, tell them how to get the book. 202-484-5461. Anytime, day or night. Outstanding. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Mr. Fuller. It is always a pleasure to uh, be able to speak with you. Uh, thank you for sharing your time again uh, with us. I know you have other things to do. Um, I definitely uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you uh, at a later date. All right. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is counter racism live on display, uh, compensating. That's what you have to do as a victim of white supremacy. You will be in this position on a frequent basis. Uh, This show, I was supposed to have Dr. I was supposed to have Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. on the show and was looking forward to it, uh, to have Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. on the show to discuss uh, the White Privilege Conference and uh, give us more information, more details about what he does with the White Privilege Conference, but he did not call in. Uh, We were not able to do that show, compensate for the difference, Uh, able to uh, just on the fly give a jingle to Mr. Fuller and see if he uh, was able to speak with us, happened to be at home, able to talk to Mr. Fuller. I think he shared some constructive information. Uh, Hopefully people tuning in get an opportunity to uh, check out Mr. Fuller's book, the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Um, You can get that if you go to uh, counter-racism.com. You can go there. Uh, Mr. Edward Williams, they have an online store. You can pick up Mr. Fuller's book. He also has audio CDs of Mr. Fuller as well. Uh, So definitely, if, uh, if you have not read his book, definitely check that out. Very good reading. Lots of constructive suggestions on how to combat the system of white supremacy. Uh, For non-white people, I also want to point that out. The book is designed, much like this show, designed for victims of white supremacy, even though I'm very aware that a lot of white people, some admitted racists, do tune into this show and have read Mr. Fuller's book. But both are designed for the victims of white supremacy. Uh, again, want to thank everybody uh, if you're tuning in live. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast. Uh, anybody that's listening to the archives, uh, you, thank you for tuning into those. If you've downloaded the show, I appreciate it. I hope uh, you've heard constructive information. I uh, also want to make sure uh, plug the blog again: racism-notes.blogspot.com. Uh, try to have constructive information on my blog. As I said, I'll have a counter-racist film review for Pulp Fiction. Uh, that should be up uh, within a day or so. also have some other uh, things that will be I'll be loading onto my blog uh, over the next week or so. I um, wanted to also say I wanted to thank again everyone for tuning in to the Cal's Context of White Supremacy. I appreciate all the support. Um, this particular program will take me to 2,500 listens from blog talk radio alone. I am very pleased, very thankful with all of the support that I uh, have received from folks checking out the show. I actually don't know how many listeners uh, I have accumulated with the program because it's rebroadcast on the Counter Racism Radio Network with Mr. Edward Williams, and I really don't know how many people listen to the program there. Uh, it's this show is also rebroadcast in other places. It's been downloaded, so I don't really know how many listeners I have, but I do know at Blog Talk Radio this episode will take me to the first 2,500 listens from Blog Talk Radio. So thank you everyone for tuning into the show. I hope it is worthy of your time and energy. If you don't think the show is constructive, um, I'd say you could either make suggestions or do something more constructive with your time and energy because I do not want to take non-white people away from doing things that uh, would be constructive for them 
tuning into this show if it's not constructive. So I definitely use my time and energy to uh, make sure that every program I do here is constructive. Uh, may not always be the case, but I certainly make an effort to make sure that uh, this show is worthy of the folks who uh, tune in to the program. Uh, if you have suggestions, if you have comments, if you have guests that you would like to uh, have on the program, you can email me. My email is huggybear, H-U-G-G-Y-B-E-A-R, at counter-racism.com. Again, that's huggybear at counter-racism.com. Feel free to shoot me an email uh, if you have any thoughts about any of the programs. Uh, or like I said, if you have uh, a guest that you would like to recommend, um, feel free to shoot me a message. I have no problem with that at all. Um, uh, like I said, programs coming down the pike. Um, definitely I'm looking forward to speaking with some of the students from the CHID Rethinking Diversity class. I think that will be very interesting uh, to get some of these white students in to talk about uh, racism, white supremacy. Um, I, we asked them in the class this past week to share racist jokes that they have heard. And every white student in the class said, yes, I've heard racist jokes. Uh, some of them said they, they had heard tons. I remember one white person was just rattling off racist jokes left and right. Uh, so uh, I think it will be a very uh, constructive, interesting broadcast when I'm able to get some of these students uh, to come on the cows, share their views on the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, and hopefully they will have some suggestions for things non-white people can do uh, to replace white supremacy with justice. Um, but, yeah, that will be coming up. Again, subscribe to the cows because you never quite know when I'm going to be doing a program. Uh, this program I promoted late because things just kind of came together uh, later in the week, uh, Thursday, Friday, so I didn't get advanced time to promote this particular broadcast. But that will not be a problem if you subscribe to the cows. If you're listening to this show uh, from Blog Talk Radio, you can look in the description for this particular episode, uh, and there will be a link that says subscribe to the cows. All you have to do is click it, put your email address in, and you will get an email update. Anytime I have a show, you'll be notified. If you are a member of Blog Talk Radio, uh, all you have to do is favorite the show. I would appreciate it if you could do that anyway. That would assist me in making things happen for the program. Uh, so if you're a member of Blog Talk Radio, favorite the show. That way you'll get updates. Uh, the cows will be in your uh, favorite host box, so you'll be able to see whenever I have an episode coming up, time, date, all that information. Um, and you can check out, you know, go to thecode.net. Uh, you can go to blacktalkradio.net. Uh, Harambe Connection Ning, Day of Outrage Ning. You can go to these sites. I try to promote my shows uh, on these sites as soon as I get dates and times nailed down. But uh, those are three easy ways to keep track of when I will have guests uh, who will be on the show, dates, times, all that information. You'll be kept in the know. Um, Again, I want to thank Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Uh, that was just an impromptu. He had time and was willing to speak with us. I appreciate uh, him hanging out with us on a beautiful Saturday. I don't know how it is in D.C. for him, but it's uh, pretty lovely out here in Seattle. I'm about to go outside. Uh, also, uh, before I end the broadcast, I highly encourage victims of white supremacy, speak to white people. I highly encourage it. I do not still do not own a phone. Uh, I do these shows, the context of white supremacy, have to work out various means of getting assistance to be able to do these programs. Uh, I have a suspected racist. He allowed me to use his phone. I didn't just get a phone. I got an iPhone, a black iPhone from a suspected racist. So I would highly encourage non-white people, victims of white supremacy, to white people and ask them to assist you in solving problems. That, I mean, that is the core of counter-racism. Get your problems solved. Get the help you need, constructive 
assistance that you need to solve your problems and ask white people to help you in that. Any white person that says they are against racism, they want to work to replace white supremacy with justice, they should be falling over themselves to get to you to help you solve your problems and to get you constructive information. Um, so I, I would highly encourage that because that's what I do. I let white people know, hey, I don't have a phone, but I'm doing my counter-racist show. Uh, I'm working to disseminate constructive information. I need access to a phone. Ask, I got a phone today. Now, I certainly won't tell you every white person is going to help you solve your problems, but at least ask. If you get it, great. If you don't, compensate for the difference. Uh, again, check out the blog racism-notes.blogspot.com. As I said, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I will have uh, another show coming up probably in the next seven days. I will have a show, uh, probably at least have two more before the end of the month. So definitely stay tuned. I appreciate everyone tuning in, checking out the broadcast. I appreciate your support, and we will continue to work to replace the system of white supremacy with justice. Thanks, everybody, and uh, happy countering racism. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity, using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com.